Although it's not usually easy to relocate a business, in recent years a trend is forming for foreign companies to move out of China. Some U.S. companies have already started it after the U.S.-China trade war broke out in 2016. Now Korea and Japan, as well as some European countries, are joining the action. The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, denied this trend on several occasions in August 2021, even calling it a rumor. From January to August 2021, China's actual utilized foreign investment reached 758.05 billion RMB, an increase of 22.3% year-on-year. Industry-specific shows that the service industry utilized 599.33 billion RMB, a year-on-year increase of 25.8%. The amount of actual utilized foreign investment in high-tech industry increased 30.2, including 35.2% growth in the high-tech services and 14.9% growth in the high-tech manufacturing. However, the official CCP figures are subject to modification as needed, making them hardly convincing to outsiders. In February 2017, China state news agency Xinhua published a report titled Foreign investment exodus affects 45 million people's rice bowls. What will happen to the huge unemployed population? The article reads, According to the National Bureau of Statistics, foreign investment in China's fixed assets was only roughly 19 billion U.S. dollars in 2016, a roughly 63% drop in just five years compared to the 2011 figure of about 50 billion U.S. dollars. But now, check the online documents published by the Chinese Ministry of Commerce. The data of 2011 and 2016 shows no signs of decline in foreign investment at all. The 2017 article, which was once republished by many leading media in mainland China, has now been removed and is only available in full on a few tiny Chinese websites. The article also reads, According to official estimates, the total number of direct jobs employed by all foreign invested enterprises exceeds 45 million, not to mention the countless suppliers in upstream and downstream enterprises that depend on them for livelihood. It is estimated to be in the hundreds of millions of people. The magnitude of the impact of foreign investment withdrawal on China's manufacturing sector is probably beyond the imagination of most people in the country. In mid-September 2021, widespread attention was drawn to the local Chinese government's desire to upgrade its industry and thus have repossessed the land, forcing South Korea's Samsung Heavy Industries, Ningbo Shipyard, to close its presence in China. Thousands of Chinese employees protested and demanded more compensation. Public information shows that the Samsung Heavy Industries Ningbo plant was established in December 1995 and employs more than 4,500 people. Samsung has been gradually closing its cell phone, computer, and TV factories in China since 2019. On September 12th, Japanese electronics giant Toshiba officially announced that its plant in Dalian would be closed on September 30th. Thousands of employees at Toshiba's Dalian plant are facing a layoff. The company has been in China for three decades. A week ago, the city's Japanese-style shopping street invested by the Chinese was forced to close its doors amid increasing online patriotic sentiment against Japan.
The overlap in timing is probably just a coincidence, but China is coming in with growing nationalism and the rise of communist ideas such as common wealth, which are worrisome for the foreign capitalists. At the same time, news broke that Toshiba Group will close 33 factories and R&D facilities in 24 cities in China at the end of December 2021. The R&D facilities and precision parts production lines will be relocated back to Japan, while the production lines for electrical appliances will be relocated to Vietnam. In early September, Swedish telecommunications manufacturer Ericsson also officially announced that it would spin off its R&D center in Nanjing to a Finland company with operations in Nanjing. Effective November 1, 2021, all affected employees totaling 630 will be offered employment with the new company. Those who decline the placement will receive a severance payment. The actions of the three large multinational companies in September 2021 have rattled the world domestically and internationally. The reality is that large companies have been quietly leaving China. In January, IBM was revealed to have completely shut down its research institute in China. German electromechanical giant Hanning was also revealed to have pulled out of Shenzhen and relocated its product line to India. Other companies leaving China include some internationally renowned ones such as Apple, Microsoft, Google, Dell, and Hewlett Packard. The Chinese media, while spinning the government's modified data, also pumped out theories to reassure the public. One of the most common narratives is that the way China attracts foreign investment has changed significantly. Low-end manufacturing is now being replaced by high-end manufacturing, high-tech enterprises, and service industries. It's not that foreign capital is leaving China, but that the target of foreign capital entering China has changed. It's not that foreign capital no longer favors China, but that high-quality foreign capital loves China now. However, data from countries that trade with China tells a different story, and it's not as optimistic as the Chinese media portrays. On September 20th, Bain & Company, one of the big three management consultancies in the U.S., released its latest annual report. It showed that overall direct investment between the U.S. and China has fallen from 62 billion U.S. dollars to 16 billion U.S. dollars between 2016 and 2020. Investment in the technology segment has plummeted 96% over that period. Technology, real estate, and healthcare-related fields are the areas where bilateral investment has fallen the most. The consulting firm believes that as the decoupling of the U.S.-China relationship and global chip shortage unfold, various governments are ramping up investments to strengthen technology and supply chain independence to protect economic and national security. Such a trend is in stark contrast to a few years ago when U.S. technology executives focused on how to enter the Chinese market. In Taiwan, data from the Ministry of Economic Affairs shows that investments by Taiwanese companies in China has plummeted by nearly 80% in the past 10 years. China is still Taiwan's top investment destination, but the U.S. has become Taiwan's second largest investment target, with the share of investment increasing dramatically from 4% 10 years ago to 23.7% in 2020. Then Japan. In April 2020, the Japanese government announced an emergency economic package in response to the pandemic, providing 2.3 billion U.S. dollars in subsidies to Japanese companies evacuating from China. More than 1,700 Japanese companies applied for the subsidy. On September 9, 2020, the Japanese economic press wrote, Japanese companies are lining up to leave China. Now Korea. According to the Export-Import Bank of Korea, the total number of new businesses and employees of Korean companies in China has been decreasing since 2015. Korean direct investment in China fell 23.1% year-on-year in 2020. Korean media recently reported that South Korea's Hyundai Motor has decided to abandon its China localization strategy and withdraw about 30 permanent manager-level employees from China. Hyundai will also sell a plant in Beijing. Like Taiwan, South Korea's exports to other countries such as the U.S. are growing. According to public data, the percentage of South Korean exports to the U.S. and the European Union averaged 21.2% from 2010 to 2017. Even with the impact of the pandemic, this number rose to 24.4% between January and July of 2020. 
it means that the impact of the Chinese economy on Korea is getting weaker. In June 2020, UBS Evidence Lab released a survey of companies during the pandemic. It shows that nearly 76% of the more than 150 manufacturing companies with factories in mainland China were ready to move or were in the process of moving their production capacity out of China. Its chief economist in China said that foreign direct investment has been declining in China's GDP for years, and foreign companies are moving production back to their home countries or diversifying to countries like Vietnam and India where tariffs are lower and labor is cheaper. For many international companies, there are other considerations besides rising labor costs in China and the CCP's ambiguous political outlook. Factors such as the U.S.-China trade war and the deteriorating U.S.-China relations, problems triggered by the global pandemic that have halted supply chains, increased freight costs and delayed shipments, plus a fresh awareness of the Chinese Communist Party in the respective national political arena and among the public. All of them have promoted international corporations to start thinking about pulling out of China. A March report by the Pew Research Center showed that 89% of Americans see China as a competitor or adversary, not a partner. In addition, a survey by an American professional body shows that a large percentage of U.S. manufacturing executives are considering reducing their reliance on China due to supply disruptions caused by the pandemic. In fact, the CCP is feeling the wave, only they are pinning the blame squarely on the U.S. On your concerns about the uncertainties in China and the U.S. relations, what I can offer is the certainty from the Chinese side. So China's economy is promising. Its market potential is huge. And its door of opening up will not close. China will continue to welcome American business to explore Chinese market. To be frank, the difficulties and uncertainties in China-U.S. trade and the business cooperation are not from the Chinese side. China welcomes American companies to continue investing in China. We want to do more business with you. But the problem is, how can we be allowed to do business as Europe? I hope that the U.S. side will meet with China halfway, follow the principles of mutual respect, equality, and the mutual benefit, and make earnest efforts to improve China-U.S. relations. The current Australian government, led by Prime Minister Scott Morrison, has been tough on the CCP. In 2020, despite China's retaliation, Australia's total exports to China exceeded 100 billion US dollars, the second highest total since 2019. This may serve as a model for other countries. A research from the Pew Research Center shows the percentage of South Koreans with negative attitudes toward the CCP has jumped from 31% in 2002 to an all-time high of 75% in 2020. At the same time, Japanese media are reporting that Japan may also elect a leader with a tough stance on China following the current Prime Minister's leaving post. Relations between China and Japan have been deteriorating since 2020. Japan's support for Taiwan has further angered the Chinese Communist government. On August 25, 2021, the U.S. House of Representatives proposed expanding the Five Eyes Coalition membership to include Japan, South Korea, India, and Germany so that intelligence can be shared with each other. It indicates that in addition to Japan and South Korea, the U.S. also values its alliance with India and Germany. The current Indian government has been tough on the CCP. Indian think tank Observer Research Foundation published a poll in August showing that 77% of India thinks China is the least trustworthy power. In Germany, an August poll shows that 58% of Germans believe that Germany should adopt a tougher policy towards China and focus more on defending Germany's interests even if economic and trade relations with China are affected. Germany is one of the most friendly governments towards the CCP in Europe. Nevertheless, the above figures also show that even in the U.S., nearly half of the entrepreneurs still have high hopes for the CCP and even seek opportunities with it. 
For example, on August 6, the U.S.-based J.P. Morgan announced that China would soon grant it a wholly owned brokerage license. On the 20th, Universal Studios celebrated its grand opening in Beijing. However, the trend suggests that more countries will take a tougher stance against the CCP, not less. It means that this trend of capital leaving China has taken hold and is accelerating. The Communist Party is sensing the crisis of foreign investment flowing out of China. The U.S. and other countries have imposed a series of sanctions on communist officials over human rights issues in Xinjiang and Hong Kong. On June 10, 2021, Beijing passed the Anti-Foreign Sanctions Law, which places a number of foreign organizations and individuals on a list of counter-sanctions, including denial of entry, seizure, and withholding of assets in China. On August 17, the Chinese media reported that the law would be voted into the Hong Kong Basic Law at the CCP's August 20th meeting. However, on the 20th, the bill was suddenly put on hold and not voted on. It's widely believed that since Hong Kong is an international financial center, the bill will likely scare away foreign investment. Out of practical considerations, Beijing has dropped the motion for the time being. Beijing, facing a crisis, has also stepped up its efforts to show its sincerity in welcoming foreign investors on various occasions. But such a gesture is unlikely to reverse the trend. As an article published by a media in mainland China, Xinhua.com, once described, this is the scary side of China's economy now, the withdrawal of foreign capital, the flea of domestic capital, and the sluggishness of domestic demand. If the unemployment wave brought by the foreign capital pullout is not handled well, the fate of many Chinese people will be rewritten under the weight of the four mountains of mortgage, education, health care, and pension. As early as 2017, these clear-headed journalists in China have already seen the crisis of China's economy today.